Well, hello and welcome. Welcome to Diverse Conversations with Ashka Patel. And today I'm very, very excited to welcome our guest, uh, none other than Tim Smith. Tim, welcome. Uh, Tim is the co-founder of Simplicity Wellness. Uh, it's a health coaching and chronic disease management practice based out of Winnipeg, Manitoba. After over a decade of experience in practice and pharmacy operations, uh, Tim believes that you know, managing patients' health should be simple, if not always easy. And I stand by that, Tim. <laughs> Uh, he's a passionate advocate for the increased role of pharmacists uh, that pharmacists play in our healthcare system, especially when it comes to improving patient outcomes, as well as the fiscal sustainability of our healthcare system. Um, and since 2019, Tim uh, serves as a board member of Pharmacists Manitoba, and he's also currently uh, serves as the vice president of the same organization. Tim, well, welcome to um, this, these conversations today. And I'm actually very excited to hear about your practice and just, you know, how you have been innovating as a pharmacist. So thank you. For for um, coming on, and I'm super excited to have this conversation with you. It's such an honor to be asked to participate in this, and I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. So I guess without um, you know any further delay, um, I did want to talk um, or start the conversation off by you know just maybe sh uh, shedding some light in terms of your achievements or some highlights from the pandemic. Um, you know, with your practice um, or um, I guess on your professional front that really enforced the importance that pharmacists play uh, within our healthcare system and, you know, just what your perspective is on that. Sure. Yeah. Right at the beginning of the pandemic, I made a career transition and I left a corporate role in pharmacy operations and returned to the front lines. And I spent most of the pandemic um, actually working in rural and remote communities across northern Manitoba and northwestern Ontario, um, serving mostly um, Indigenous clients. And it, it was a tremendous honor to me. And it really relit the passion I have for direct patient care and, and really reinforced to me that I want to be on the front lines somewhere. So for me, you know, some of the things that I felt were really important was providing evidence-based information, of course, related to COVID and the COVID-19 vaccines and, you know, addressing the questions, concerns, vaccine hesitancy issues that, that people have. But I think beyond the pandemic, um, specific issues, I think, you know, a, a lot of people's chronic health conditions were you know, challenged in terms of their management, uh, lack of access to other providers, people's attentions just focused elsewhere. And so really having the opportunity to dig in on conditions like diabetes, hypertension, COPD, and try to engage in comprehensive medication management, I think is really essential. And it's really um, an area that we as pharmacists, you know, can thrive in. Uh, I agree. And wow, that's, um, that's amazing in terms of just the amount of experience and your motivation. I mean, we all know the challenges that exist within our remote communities, especially with our indigenous populations. And, you know, for you to take that a step forward and, you know, actually create a business out of it or a business idea to help support that, those communities um, and, you know, patients at large, I think speaks volumes to your dedication to patient care. And I commend you for that. Um, I guess, and that kind of leads me to my next question is, you know, uh, uh, as you are an innovator and an entrepreneur in community pharmacy practice and like, you know, creating an innovative model, how did you land on this idea to create this business model and like, you know, to go ahead with it? Because I know innovation in pharmacy can sometimes be um, inhibitor because, you know, we are a little hesitant to try new practices or try new business models because of the regulatory framework and everything else that exists. You know, what motivated you to just do something innovative. Yeah, I think after, you know, over a decade in practice, I've come to learn what I like about, you know, healthcare and about pharmacy practice and what I don't like or what I would like to spend less of my time doing. And so as I returned to frontline pharmacy practice, you know, it, originally the intention was to open a traditional dispensing practice with a heavy emphasis on services. And as time went on in the pandemic, and I was working at a number of different other pharmacies across Manitoba and Ontario, you know, I really came to revise my vision for what I wanted to do. There are, you know, many great um, you know, dispensing traditional pharmacies in communities all across Canada. And it seems like a new one is popping up on a corner every week at this point. And it's, you know, although I thought I had a strong differentiator, 
is what we need really another competitor into the marketplace? And so I saw the idea of focusing strictly on services with no dispensing component to be an area that really suited my collaborative spirit. I don't want to be out there competing with my colleagues. I want to help be a force multiplier for them and for the other physicians, nurse practitioners, and allied health providers. So Simplicity Wellness was born from a desire to really help elevate other people's practice. We know there is so much need need for advanced scope services. Our clients are sicker and sicker, even though they're living longer and longer. 40% of Canadians have one chronic disease, more than one in 10 have multiple chronic diseases, and quite simply our healthcare system isn't getting the job done. We can't abandon our traditional role of dispensing medications and managing medication therapies like that, but we also need opportunities to go deeper. And so, you know, rather than just be, you know, one one needle in a haystack out there in, in the pharmacy landscape, I really wanted to see how can I work with other people and help, you know, bring the care to their clients that they know that they need, but can't necessarily deliver themselves at all times. For sure. And I, I agree with you. I mean, I think the pandemic really put a highlight on that, right, in terms of how important chronic disease management is for patients. And unfortunately, because of the, the open and close and all the mixed messaging and communication that happening, it was creating a lot of confusion for patients of where do they go uh, for their healthcare needs. And I'm, I'm glad that you um, served, um, you know, to those needs and by creating this practice of yours, because I think that really makes a big difference. And I think that leads me to my next question is, you know, uh, scope of practice is also very, always very important important when we're looking at innovation and, you know, how we are trying to create a difference in, uh, for our patients. How did you feel supported or like, you know, how, what, where, are there any changes you would like to see to the scope of practice, especially in Manitoba, because that's what you, that's where you primarily practice um, to kind of help support you support your patients? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question because I am licensed in four jurisdictions and the scope that I have available, available to me differs so tremendously depending upon what side of which border I'm standing on. Mm -hmm. And so here in Manitoba, we are very challenged, um, both in terms of scope of practice, but especially in terms of public reimbursement for services. And this continues to be an ongoing battle. And it's one of the reasons I joined the Board of Pharmacists Manitoba was to be a strong advocate for the enhanced role of pharmacists in the healthcare system. Um, you know, from my perspective, you know, there's really kind of two sides of the cookie that we're nibbling on. One is kind of the minor ailment side, where we're taking, you know, some of the low hanging fruit away so that physicians and nurse practitioners can focus on the more complex clients. And I do think there's a role for that because pharmacy plays, um, you know, is extremely convenient and extremely accessible. But that said, for me, maybe it's just my interest, but I also think it's, it's the more important one from a social role is where we play on the more complex, the chronic disease patients, and how can we support physicians, nurse practitioners, and other healthcare providers in a collaborative setting to help drive better health outcomes. So, you know, as I mentioned, you know, we're seeing our clients get sicker over time, and we're also seeing our healthcare budgets increasingly stretched. What we're doing is not working both fiscally and clinically. And so I think that's the real opportunity for us. So I would like to see increased scope of practice related to comprehensive medication management, a pharmacist prescribing for schedule one drugs across a wide variety of conditions, if not, you know, blanket all, all open and reimbursement for medication management services, because this is the real um, opportunity for us. I agree. I agree. And you, you hit all the, all the points uh, in terms of, you know, what are our needs and lacks. And I think, um, you know, basically what I'm also hearing is like, we need a harmonization of our scope of practice throughout the country so that, you know, when a patient visits a pharmacist or at a pharmacy, like, you know, they know what to expect out of that pharmacist and not necessarily be confused of, okay, I'm getting this in Alberta, but I'm not getting this here. Right. Um, and um, obviously we all know Alberta is the most advanced when it comes to our scope of practice. So we all have a lot of catching up to do to meet that par. Um, so I guess- and, and I'll say, sorry, I just want to interject there. Yeah, no. I, and interesting, I know pharmacists from Ontario quite often feel left behind in terms of scope and practice and reimbursement. Yes. But from my perspective, as someone sitting on the western side of the Manitoba-Ontario border, my practice is greatly elevated when I'm in Ontario, to be quite honest. Right. Um, you know, the ability through the MedsCheck program to have, have a publicly funded mechanism to deal with clients who have chronic disease, especially diabetes, really um, puts front and center that medication management aspect. 
Also, the fact that uh, Ontario enacted most of the Section 56 exemptions to the CDSA was tremendous. I worked in a methadone suboxone practice um, throughout much of the winter, and having the ability to extend and adapt prescriptions was amazing, especially when the clinic was closed on weekends and scripts were missed. Um, I've, I've encountered great barriers with that here on the Manitoba side of things, and we continue to push. So I think, you know, really that harmonized scope across all, all provinces and territories is absolutely essential, and, and I know it's a focus for CPA. That's correct. Yes. Um, and I, I, I think you you actually you bring a good point. Um, I think sometimes, you know, we kind of take our own um, what do we have taken for granted. Right. And um, oftentimes in Ontario, because I practice in Ontario, my, my vision and my you know, what I want is so limited to what I do not have that I forget that, you know, there are other provinces that still have a lot of catching up to do to even come up to Ontario and you rate that. Thank you for putting some light on that because that definitely helps me be more grateful for what I have right now. Um, and I think that kind of also uh, brings me to another question is about telepharmacy because that is another thing that COVID has brought up is, you know, uh, this ability to provide virtual care. How has that been for your practice? Has that been an uh, impactor or enabler? Yeah, it, it's a really great fit for us, um, you know, for a few reasons, right? I mean, one, during the pandemic, we're trying to limit contacts. And, you know, what I find when I am working locum shifts in other pharmacies, the shift to providing delivery services is so tremendous. So before you would see your client on every time they pick up and, you know, counseling them is easy, following up with them with conversations is easy, training them on an insulin injection or inhaler technique is easy. Um, but when we're delivering it, providing those services over the phone is less easy. And so I think there is and there needs to be a real shift towards telepharmacy, you know, both as we, you know, mitigate the risks of the pandemic, but also just as a convenience factor moving forward. I mean, our clients' time is valuable to them. Our time is valuable to us. And, you know, if we can provide services in a way that helps, you know, make their day easier, I, I, I think that's tremendous. I mean, there's a reason why we see physicians now are doing almost all of their appointments by phone or virtually if possible. I mean, it helps them manage their schedule and clients don't need to drive across the city. Here in Winnipeg, we're fortunate that we don't have as much gridlock as the GTA, but I can't imagine driving from one end of, uh, of Toronto to the other for a doctor's appointment that's going to last 10 minutes or to, you know, talk with my pharmacist to learn how to use a Ventolin inhaler. It just doesn't make sense in 2021 anymore. I agree. I agree. Yeah, the gridlock is real and the struggle is real. The pandemic had provided some relief, but we're starting to get back into it now. So <laughs> not going to say much about that. <laughs> but so uh, in, in, I guess if you had to sum it up, uh, the future of telepharmacy, how do you envision it? Or like, you know, where do you see that going? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think in some circumstances, there is no substitute for in-person care. And, you know, there will always be a role for that. But I think especially as, you know, disruptors into the pharmacy space, such as mail order pharmacy, and especially Amazon, which we all know is on the horizon, um, delivery is going to become more and more prominent. And so, you know, either we're going to be abandoning the standards of practice that we need to uphold, which of course cannot happen, or we need to find alternate means of delivering the care that we're used to providing. And, you know, part of it is a generational shift as well. Um, you know, as, as you know, the, the boomers age on, I, I mean, many of them are very technologically adept already. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, as the generation older than them passes on, you know, everyone out there will be comfortable with technology to some level or another. Um, so I, I think it's really just, it's going to grow from here. And I, I don't think we're going to see it shrink back after the pandemic. I agree with you. I, I agree with you on that too. I, I do think like, you know, as you said, like this, the telepharmacy actually helps all of us in a way, like it, it's a more symbiotic relationship where we, which where you know, everyone's benefiting out of it. Right. And I mean, it helps pharmacy kind of decide on their staffing and their workload and, you know, how do they need to schedule based on the appointments that are scheduled for, you know, the pharmacist, pharmacy technician, whoever it is that's providing that service. So I agree. I am optimistic, but we'll see how it goes because this pandemic has been unpredictable. Everything that has come out of it is unpredictable. So we'll see what happens. Um, and I do want to speak to, there's also a great opportunity for pharmacists in terms of like remote patient monitoring as well. Yes. So, you know, before, if we wanted to review someone's diabetes logbooks with them, you know, they have to bring in their pen and paper and sit down with us. And now, you know, they don't even need to push the information to us. We link with them, can rev review from their OneTouch or Contour or, or, you know, Libre monitor, and then we can hold a virtual consultation with them. Bluetooth enabled, um, you know, 
blood pressure monitors, sleep monitors, exercise and fitness trackers. You know, we have the opportunity to do so many things remotely now. And so I think it's really just a matter of our practices catching up to where the technology is letting us go. I agree. And I, and I also feel like, you know, we need to have a little bit more flexibility with our regulations as well, because I think sometimes our regulations can constrict, um, you know, how we're able to provide these services. And I know, like, you know, in Ontario, we had to have our college, you know, kind of tell us that it's okay for us to provide virtual care. Um, and so I think we also need to look at it from a regulatory framework. And yeah, I'm sure um, you, you would agree because, you know, that regulatory framework really dictates how we provide our practice or our, our services to our patients. Um, and I think that kind of is a good segue because in the next part, I wanted to focus on what some of the challenges, because, you know, we've spoken about the highlights and everything else, but I want to also speak to some of the challenges of barriers. Um, you may, you have already alluded to some of them, but I think it's important that we have a conversation about it just so that, you know, it helps all of us kind of understand where we need to go together um, to fulfill our fullest potential as pharmacists, innovators, entrepreneurs, um, you know, to help our patients, but also, you know, to get that professional satisfaction, because I think that sometimes we do not talk much about because we are a healthcare profession. So we are always about patient outcomes and patient focus. I agree. But I think you also need to have that career satisfaction for you to sustain yourself in this career for X number of years that you see yourself practicing, right? Mm -hmm. I absolutely would agree with that. I mean, that, that that's why we embarked on this journey. You know, it's like, been, as I said, been long enough in this career to know what I don't like. And I have far too long left to practice to just keep banging my head against the same door all day, every day. I agree. I agree. And I think uh, me and both, you both can speak to this a lot because I think I've had a similar experience in a journey where, you know, tried a few things, did not like them, liked some of parts of it, not all of it. And then you, you, you create something that, you know, you very, you like the, you put together all the pieces you like, and then, you know, that's the, that's the path you choose for yourself. So uh, in terms of what were some of the challenges that you experienced, you know, as you were coming up with this business idea and like, you know, just even implementing it into practice, like what were some of the barriers that you experienced? I, I think the biggest thing is just with a, a new practice model, and especially one that is not sustained by any public funding whatsoever, is the fact that we can't rely on business to find us. I mean, if you open a pharmacy on, you know, an intersection of two busy streets, mm -hmm. even if you do nothing for marketing, some people will eventually come in the door just out of sheer curiosity. And because, you know, our services are strictly cognitive and primarily virtual, you know, it's really on us to develop and launch a, you know, marketing plan and to really understand our demographic and their pain points and the value that we can provide to them. And I'll say this is still like we're in the infancy of our journey here. You know, these aren't areas that we, my partner and I, have had any formal training in and very limited personal experience. So we're, we're still just at baby steps here. But, you know, I feel like it's rolling like rolling a snowball down a mountain, right? You've got to keep pushing it for a bit, but eventually it's going to have the momentum to take care of itself. So I think that's the real barrier. And I think that's, you know, a real need for resources within the pharmacy community is in supporting um, business development, business growth, marketing areas like that. And, you know, the, um, the, the pharmacy management textbook that's available and and the course that's available through OPA I think it is um is is a tremendous resource I've I've got the textbook as soon as it came out I haven't taken the course but that was something that as we were building our business plan and working through it was a terrific resource for us and I, I would love to see more continuing education on the business side of things and the innovation side of things at pharmacy conferences going forward it's important for us to be clinicians but if we can't get to a circumstance where we're in engaging with our clients to put that clinical knowledge into effect, um, it's essentially meaningless. Exactly, exactly. It's it's kind of like, you know, how we say um, even not doing anything is in itself an action too, or, you know, it's a, it's a, a decision that you made for your patient um, that resulted in some sort of an outcome. And I agree. I think, um, like, I, I really do feel like I think there needs to be more focus within our profession, through our associations, our schools, um, to, you know, allow, uh, provide us with the knowledge and also the continuing education, as you mentioned, um, you know, especially when we're trying to enter into niche markets and like, you know, just coming up with a new idea and like, you know, what are some of the foundational stuff you need to understand to even create that business idea? Because sometimes I feel like that is also a challenge that you, you know, like you brought up. It's like, you know, 
sometimes you don't know where to go to even get this information. Um, and maybe um, I think with, through this talk, you are, you're helping uh, listeners, you know, who may be contemplating on doing something like this. Um, you're helping them with their experience. So I think um, that is a great, great asset. Um, and I think one of the things, uh, reimbursement you've already spoken about, because, you know, that, that whole public funded model, yes, we rely so heavily on it. Um, and I think with pharma care coming, that is, you know, it's making me a little and see my chair is what I'm going to say. Uh, it has its good things and you know obviously there's always challenges with any good thing there's always an other side of the coin um, and I, I'm just um, not sure how that's going to play out but we'll, we'll see. Uh, but in reimbursement um, do you find that there's any challenges when it comes to selling these services to your patients um, and you know having them kind of come on board um, to tap into your expertise? Yeah, and I, I think as pharmacists, we are naturally very scared to ask our patients for money. Um, and we want everything to be covered for them, uh, from the drugs to the services. And so, you know, I think that's a real barrier each of us has to overcome. And we had to really question ourselves on what our price point was going to be, because you know, what, what will the market bear? What is the value we provide? And ultimately we settled on a much higher price point and a much you know, more premium service because we can either help a lot of people at a mediocre level, or we can help fewer people to a much more significant life-changing meaningful level. And quite, quite honestly, I'm gonna be scared to ask them for money, whether it's a little amount or a big amount. So why not just go for it and make sure that you've got the funding that will sustain the level of services and care that you actually want to provide and will feel actualized by. And thus far, we have not had pushback on price from the people who have engaged with us. Um, you know, I think when you look out there at, you know, what comparable expert services are, if you go see a lawyer, you go see a mechanic, you go see, a, you know, a, a psychiatrist, you're paying a fair chunk of change. And we have that same level of skill, expertise, and training in our domain as well. And we shouldn't be scared to monetize it. Now, I recognize that, you know, in, in pharmacies that are dispensing, you know, they have other economic levers and, and revenue streams that they can pull on. So oftentimes services end up being as a loss leader. But I think that also ends up compromising the quality of the services in many cases, because it really is an add-on. It's almost like the toothpaste you get sold at the till at Loblaws, right? It's here's, let's just get a basket filler for you so you go home feeling happy. Um, but that that's not the value that we can provide. And so I really think getting into to, you know, you mentioned niches earlier. I think identifying the niche that you can serve or want to serve or have expertise in is essential. And then when you can position yourself as an expert in that area, you can command a lot higher revenue source from that. And I think ultimately doing that for fewer people is going to be a lot more fulfilling than doing, you know, trying to please everyone everywhere. Now, I believe strongly in, in health equity. And so from that perspective, I would love to see services like these publicly funded so that everyone has access to them. And certainly we're exploring partnerships with organizations so that we can help make sure that people don't miss out on this level of care. But I think at the same time, we have to set the bar really high and, you know, providing a really high bar of services means asking for, you know, the money that funds them. I agree. I agree. And you actually hit a very good point with that, because I think we we need to be mindful of, you know, what do our services translate into in, in terms of outcomes for our patients? And, you know, being scared to charge a fee should not be our deterrence. It should rather be our focus should be on the quality of the care that we provide for our patients. As you said, like, you know, we can't just be serving um, services as a transactional, uh, you know, value it should it should have a core value that nobody else can replicate um and i think you know mine and your both practices like that's actually what we rely heavily on is you know pr achieving those outcomes for our patients and just making sure that they, they're living a good life so that they don't have to worry about the health uh, components affecting all the other parts of their life so i agree like quality should be our focus and um, i'm hoping that you know as more services become available for pharmacists to be able to uh you know provide to our patients on a publicly funded level that you know we we'll, would we'll try to leverage the quality aspect of it rather than the volume of it because uh, really there's not much we're going to achieve with volume unless we are creating quality <laughs> outcomes for our patients. And you hit on something really great there on helping people live a good life. You know it's not about the features that we have in our services it's about the benefits we confer to the people who pay for them and so I think that's really essential and so that that's where you can justify that revenue from. Um, you know people are people 
perceive Canada's healthcare system as publicly funded and free at the point of service. But, you know, people pay for health and wellness in many different areas, you know, whether it is supplements, whether it's organic food, whether it's going to see a naturopath, whether it's gym membership, sports equipment, personal trainers, Canadians are willing to pay for health and wellness. Um, but they need to perceive that you're going to help them live a better life. Exactly. And, and so that's what we really need to communicate our value on is how can we help you have the energy to play with your grandchildren? How can we help you crush it in the C-suite? How can we help you, you know, you learn to walk again because, you know, you, you're not crippled by, you know, medications. Exactly. Um, you know, it, it's that value that we can provide to them and really helping them envision their future self. What is life like now? And what is life like after these services? And th that's what we really need to hit on in our marketing. Wow, that's amazing. I, I agree. Um, I agree. And I think we're both like, you know, we're on similar page when it comes to, um, you know, just how can we best support our patients live a holistic and a good holistic life, right, where they don't have to really worry about their health um, as being the, the, the barrier to leading that good life. Um, and I guess that kind of leads me to my next question, meaning, you know, how do we promote, like, how do we promote innovation within pharmacy? Because that has been something that I personally, in my personal opinion, I feel like, you know, we are slowly getting there, like, you know, with early adopters like yourself, um, who are really challenging the status quo of like, you know, I'm not saying traditional pharmacy model is bad or anything like that. But I, I do feel like, you know, I think we, we need some disruptors, we need some innovators within our, our space to really take, um, you know, pharmacy and like, what pharmacists can, are able to do for their patients and, you know, help bring it to spotlight. So what do you think can help promote that innovation within our profession? Yeah, I mean, I mean, first, I just want to say, I think disruption is coming, whether we are the leaders of it or not. Um, you know, again, I, I, I mentioned Amazon every time I have a conversation on this, but, th you know, th this is coming to the future of our profession, and private capital is coming in and buying up pharmacies, and there's consolidation in healthcare, and there's virtual care, and, you know, all of these things are going to change. So we can sit there and let these forces change us, or we can try to, you know, get ahead of the tide. And, you know, I, I think first and foremost, I, I see, you know, so much great energy and ideas coming from new graduates these yes. days. I've been really fortunate to, you know, interview and encounter and network and get to know a number of uh, new, recent and soon to be graduates um, from PharmD programs and, uh, you know, other universities across the country. And these are our future and like they're, they're light years already ahead of where I was at similar steps in, in my career. But I think for those of us who have been practicing for a while, I, I think again, it, it comes down to we need to do a really good job of highlighting those who are innovating. And that's why I think your, your podcast is fantastic. We need to celebrate these successes. We need to hear about them. Um, Pharmacy Practice plus Business Magazine has been essential to me throughout my career. Yes. I have, you know, especially, you know, in the first few years of my career working in rural Northwestern Ontario, you know, you don't get to see a lot of what's going on in the rest of the country. And so that magazine was my outlet to see who's really moving the needle in the rest of the country and, you know, learning about innovative practices, you know, people like Carlene Olexen, for example, who I, I really look up to as a standard bearer in pharmacy. Um, and I've had the opportunity now throughout my career to meet and get to know some of these people. And it's been a tremendous experience. So I think we need to continue to share that. We need to do that through our advocacy bodies. We need to do that through our social media. We need to we need the public to understand the innovation that is happening and the innovation that can happen. Because I think when the public understands in Ontario or Manitoba what they're missing out on that Albertans have access to, that's when they put the pressure on the politicians and that's when we see change happen. So I think we just need to celebrate the innovation, but we also need to be not scared to go out there and make it happen. For sure, for sure. So in that, I guess in that line of thought, um, you know, how do you, um, what would be one piece of advice for pharmacists um, who are currently practicing, um, you know, to prepare for the future? Like what would be one piece of advice that you'd like to give them? Yeah, I, I think just don't be scared. Um, you know, you, there's a lot of concern in our, you know, profession about changes that have happened, about, you know, staffing issues, about consolidation, um, corporatization. These factors are going to happen, but you have to take your fate into your own hands. Um, you know, nobody is going to go out there and hand the perfect job to you on a plate. Um, you have to go grab it. And in some cases, if it doesn't exist, you might have to create it. And yes, 
that's scary. That is really scary. Um, terrified every day um, at, at what might come. But at the same time, you have to ask yourself, are you really happy doing what you're doing? If you are, keep doing that. I'm thrilled for you. That's awesome. But I know many aren't, or many have concerns about the future. And, you know, the, the saying is, you know, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. Well, the same thing goes for your career, right? Uh, I mean, obviously, it's great to be way out in front of things. But if you're realizing now that you have concerns, now is the time to take action. Agreed. That, that is one solid advice. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Um, and, and I guess one advice for, um, you know, pharmacy students, I know you work very closely with them, as you alluded to, and like, you know, what would be one piece of advice for our students and our new grads who are about to enter a profession? It, it would be the exact same thing, really. It's, you know, you have to go out there and create it. Don't be afraid. And, you know, a, a, as I said on the earlier question, you know, the students are coming out better trained, better prepared, I think, than ever before, both in terms of clinical, business, all, all areas of, you know, pharmacy practice. Don't get let yourself get into situations where you have your dreams and your passion constrained by the workplaces you find yourself in. Find yourself an employer that is going to let you practice in areas that you want. Strike out on your own, whether it's in a clinical based or, or you know, as an independent owner, don't be scared to go do it because you have a long career ahead of you. There's going to be lots of ups and downs and there's going to be change. Um, but, you know, don't be afraid to do it. And if you can, find mentors um, who are willing to show you the ropes or willing to teach you from what, you know, the mistakes they've made and the things that helped get them there. Um, and, and really, you know, learn from them and, and bond together and be part of your professional advocacy organization. Take out memberships in OPA and Pharmacist Manitoba. You know, th these are your voices um, to help ensure that the issues that you are facing are, get heard. I agree. Uh, you nailed it all. <laughs> uh, and I cannot emphasize the, the importance of mentorship, um, you know, enough to our current students and graduates and even like, you know, any professional who's out there trying to seek some um, advice or information like it's, you know, I think we have a fairly open profession where everyone's willing to help each other. It's just a matter of reaching out um, and, you know, just sharing what your concerns are and just seeing if, you know, somebody's a good fit that can help you provide that guidance or even some insights because sometimes you just need somebody to provide you with a different insight or a view to what you're looking at and some that that usually you know that did the trick for me um and you know uh, like uh, I, I yeah the mentorship part I cannot emphasize that enough and I think as um last question to wrap this entire conversation up because this has been I have to tell you to him like this has been such a great and motivational um conversation you have motivated me to like you know <laughs> go in and go out and conquer the world uh, <laughs> But I think it's also, uh, you know, I, I, what you have shared is really important. And, and like, you know, that was really what I wanted to achieve through this podcast was have those open conversations. Because, um, you know, change is scary. Innovation is scary. But I think we need to understand that we all go through those emotions when we are, um, you know, on, embarking on that journey. Um, but it's a matter of persisting and continuing on that journey and not being afraid of the outcomes. And I think you are a, an example of just that, where, you know, you have chosen to go out and venture and create your own niche um, that can, you know, give you the per professional satisfaction and you're making such a tremendous impact in your patients' lives as well. Uh, so I guess just to wrap this up, how do you describe the future of pharmacy over the next five years? You know, I, I think for all the disruption that we've seen over the past, uh, you know, 10 to 15 years, I think the next five to 10 years are going to be even more disruptive and more tumultuous. You know, I really see the advancement of virtual care. I really see the consolidation uh, and, you know, vertical integration of health care organizations. And, uh, you know, I've mentioned it twice. It'll still be the third time Amazon is on the horizon. And so, you know, if we think that the ways that we have been getting the job done are going to hold us well in the next five to 10 years, I think we're sorely mistaken. Change is coming and we, we need to get out in front of it. So if you are a pharmacy owner right now, I would strongly encourage you to double down on services and find your niche because you are not going to be able to do it faster, better, and cheaper than Amazon. Like that, that's a given. And if you are looking at where you want to take your career as, you know, a, a non-owner pharmacist, you know, really give thought to the things that you want to do and the value that you want to provide. Invest in, you know, a certification, you know, start putting it into practice with your patients today and start thinking about the opportunities, get, a, get ahead of the rising tide. 
Um, you know, I, I think the, the future for pharmacy is bright. I think the future for pharmacists is bright, but it, it's going to rely on all of us moving forward um, and, and really taking action. You know, a, a saying that I like is if you're standing still, then you're falling behind. So you always need to be moving forward. Agreed, agreed. And what wise words to, um, you know, wrap up our conversation today. Um, I agree. Like, I think we, um, I think there is this, um, we do have a fighting spirit within our profession where we have gone through quite a, a few ups and downs. And but I do think that we need to take this pandemic and take the positive that is brought to us um, during this pandemic and, you know, kind of do what Tim has done in, in terms of, you know, creating a niche and a space for yourself. And, um, you know, hopefully, it will also give you the professional satisfaction and, you know, achieve the outcomes that you're set out to achieve. Thank you so much, Tim. It was a pleasure having you. And trust me, like, I think uh, this is going to be a, a motivational episode, that's for sure, because uh, you have definitely inspired me. And, uh, um, you know, I am I'm excited to, um, to have our listeners tune into this conversation and, you know, get the get the wise words um, that you have uh, really, you know, offered today. Um, I'm so thankful for that. It was truly an honor. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Well, thank you and have a good day. You too. Thanks.